Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Totally Awesome Podcast. My name is Josh Ageddon, your host as always. Today, I am going to be reviewing AEW's most recent pay-per-view, Full Gear. Happened the other day, and uh, it took me two days, but I watched the entire show. Well, almost the entire show. Uh, we'll get to that. Uh, the reason why it took me a couple days is because I have this lovely little thing called work, and there's this other lovely little thing that I need called sleep. So, I did watch the entire show, and I have lots of thoughts and opinions on it. And also, this is going to be the first uh, pay-per-view review of mine that's going to be on both YouTube and Rumble. So, thank you for joining me on both YouTube and Rumble, wherever you're listening to this. So, yeah, AEW Full Gear. Um, I thought it was fine. Not one of their better shows, and I'll be perfectly honest. Uh, I have not been watching the build of the show. I, I have not watched an episode of Dynamite in forever, or Rampage, or Collision, or whatever other shows they're doing. Um, now, as I say that, I, I will acknowledge that I have heard that the build to this show has been utterly horrendous. Like, literally everyone I listen to has been saying, dude, their shows are getting so bad. <laughs> and they're, the viewership is dwindling, the attendance is horrific. So, um, as someone who hasn't really been paying all that much attention to AEW, I can tell you, like, from purely from an objective standpoint, uh, this company looks like it's just slowly dying. And... I mean, it's self-inflicted wounds. I mean, go, go through the catalog of reviews on this channel. Or if you're on Rumble, go to my YouTube channel and then go through the catalog of the reviews on there. Or go to the Court Marshall Podcast. Shout out to Sean McCarty and Skylar Greenberg, who I know did not watch this show because they absolutely despise AEW and I don't blame them. And not just us, but like any other podcaster that isn't just a Tony Khan shill... We've laid out the problems with this company, which were on full display during the show, which I'll get into, but this show, more than anything else, is just more evidence that Tony Khan is never going to learn, and this show is just going to continue to spiral into nothingness, but again, I did not hate this show, I didn't love this show, I, I have a very middling opinion of this show. My biggest issue with this show, honestly, uh... Two main issues with this show. For one, the format of this show was horrendous. It is just rapid fire. Match after match after match after match after match. With no room to breathe. Like, Will Ospreay and Kyle Fletcher had an awesome match. And then we went to another match. And then another match. And another match. The first half of the show, I honestly really liked. Until after, like, the big matches happened... And then we had another half of the show to go, and the crowd just died because the crowd was exhausted. Like, I don't want to hear anyone give Triple H any shit, or WWE any shit, over their five to six match pay-per-views. Because at the very least, they space out the matches and have other stuff going on to allow you to catch your breath so the crowd can be invested when the important shit starts happening. I will always take and a WWE pay-per-view formatted like that over an AEW rapid-fire machine gun, like, bang, 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 bang! We're doing all of these matches! So many moves! So many near falls! Oh my god! I I'll, t I'll take a WWE show the way Triple H has been doing it over the past year over at an AEW show like this any day of the week because it's exhausting. Just watching the show is exhausting. Like... And uh, uh, another problem that kind of coincides with that is after a while, you just get numb to all the big moves and all the, all the other big moves. And you know, look, this more just big moves. And oi, 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 this show, this show is everything that's wrong with AEW in a nutshell. And I'll get more, uh, I'll get more into specifics as I go th from match to match. But my God. The second half of this show, like, it wasn't, like, horrendous. It wasn't, like, embarrassing. It wasn't awful. But, man, the crowd was gasping for air. They've been, like, the whole thing with uh, Wrestle Dream and, like, before that, when John Moxley would attack Brian Danielson and they would need to bring out a 
fucking oxygen tank to revive him. I felt like you needed that for everyone in the audience on this show by the end of it, because they were they were like gasping for air. It was it was sad. It it did it was the worst it got was during the uh, match between Kanosuke Takeshita and Ricochet, where the crowd was practically silent. But again, I'll, I'll get into all that. No, I did not watch the uh, the pre-show. Uh, I I never watch any pre-shows. But I will say, the the fact on, that on this show, what was the main, the main event of this pre-show? Um, it was Big Boom AJ with Big Justice and the Rizzler versus QT Marshall. And apparently, the, from what I've heard, this is the most prom heavily promoted thing on AEW programming, like, leading up to this show, and it was the main event of the pre-show. Apparently, Big Boom, AJ, whatever, and The Rizzler are huge TikTok stars and whatnot. Um, I don't have a TikTok, and I never will, because it's Brain Cancer, the app, uh... So I don't have a clue what any of that is or means or indicates. Uh, it just makes me hate Gen Z even more. So yeah, I didn't see any of that. And I do not like the human race. That Those are my thoughts on that. Uh, and the show actually started with another motherfucking fatal four-way tag team. <laughs> Oh, was Tony Khan and uh, okay. All right, I actually have a clip. I have a clip for this that I want to play right now. My thoughts on the show starting with a fatal four-way tag team match. How many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? I do not under. I will never understand Tony Khan's massive fucking erection for multi-man tag team matches. I uh, I'm done. I'm not watching more of these. I'm done. I skipped it. Like on all of our shows, we are all me, Sean, and Skyler are always allotted one skip. The second I saw this, and I was like, I was like immediate skip. And of course, they kick off the show with this stupid four-way tag. I'm not even naming the teams. I don't care. What is wrong with having a regular tag team match between two tag teams? Why can't we just have that? I have another clip. This is what I think of multi-man tags. Dookie! Thank you, Dr. Robotnik. So yeah, I skipped it. Not gonna talk about it. Immediately moving on to the actual first match of the show. Uh, one positive I will say about this show, by the way. Other than the stupid four-way tag that I didn't even watch because fuck four-way tag matches and fuck triple threat tag team matches and any kind of tag team match that isn't two people versus two other people, um, there was nothing but just singles matches on this show. There were no, like, hardcore brawls. There was there was no stip match on this show, which is bewildering for an AEW show because they love cramming hardcore nonsense into every nook, cranny, and crevice that they can put their grubby little mitts on just to agitate me. Uh, so the fact that this was just a bunch of singles matches was a positive, although a couple of these did not need to be on this show. The, the, like, if they would have adopted Triple H's five matches, that's all you're getting, formula, that would have immediately boosted this show for me. Um, so, the actual show started, as far as I'm concerned, started with uh, MJF versus Roderick Strong in a singles match. And I thought it was a good match, but I'm going to be real honest. This might be uh, sacrilege. I might have to start playing Marilyn Manson's new song, Sacrilegious for what I'm about to say, uh, MJF is getting very boring. His shtick is so played out, he's been the same thing for years now. He's a smartass, I'm gonna talk shit, and I'm gonna talk even more shit. You're all a bunch of losers and nerds and dorks, and I'm the bully. I'm over it, like, when he before the match actually right as the match started and he grabbed the microphone and started cutting a promo on Roderick Strong I honestly started I I, I honestly groaned cuz I was like all right it's this he's going to say something controversial okay 
made a made a reference to Roderick Strong's mom shooting his dad. Okay, there there's the heat that we got our we got our heat boys. The same kind of heat the MJF gets all the time by taking a low shot on whoever he's wrestling and insulting the crowd, calling the crowd white trash. I've seen this before. MJF should have gone to WWE in all honesty. In all honesty, the, the worst thing MJF could have done was tattooing AEW to his leg and just just signing him resigning himself to just the unending oblivion and nothingness that is all elite wrestling now. Cause he's just doing the same like at least when he turned babyface and was friends with Adam Cole for a little while, it was an evolution of his character. But my god, ever since they dropped this, ever since they dropped that, kind of, and this whole feud between him and Adam Cole has kind of been going on, still kind of, but not really, but still maybe, they're, they switched to heel and versus babyface again, their whole feud is confusing and makes no sense. It absolutely feels like backtracking for MJF, and now he's just heel MJF before he turned babyface for no reason again, and he's just, it just makes him feel bland in one note. But the match itself was fine. Uh, I really enjoyed the the working on the arm, and Roderick Strong did a very good job selling the arm. Uh, Roderick Strong is really good. He does not get enough credit for how good he is. I love his thing for I'm going to backbreaker the fuck out of you. He gives so many devastating looking backbreakers that even Bane is blushing. Dude, like I I love I can watch Roderick Strong wrestle all day. And one of my favorite things he did was during the match he locked uh, MJF in the um, the Texas Cloverleaf, but he uh, willingly uh, let go of the hold because his arm was hurting and he was like God I can't hold this hold I can't keep hold of this anymore because my arm hurts. So I like that I like stuff like that. There was some selling in this match. There was actually a decent bit of selling, uh, for the most part on this show. Uh, which I appreciated. Um, but yeah, this was a good match. I enjoyed it. There was some back and forth. A lot of it was MJF just going after the arm. I loved the finish. I loved the finish of this match. Where uh, they they did a double down after Roger Strong hit him with move after move after move. Then MJF peels off a brain buster. And they're both down. Roger Strong goes for the cover. And as soon as uh, MJF kicked out, he twisted over into his uh, armbar submission, which I haven't seen him use in a long time, honestly. It's been a while since I've seen MJF use the salt of the earth armbar, and Roderick Strong immediately tapped out. So that's that's one way to do it. I really liked the solid transition into the armbar for the submission win, especially since MJF had been working on it the entire match. So yeah, I thought this was good. Um, it did kind of feel like a TV match, you can feel that the match that they really want to do is MJF versus Adam Cole, and honestly, it would make the most sense to do that match at World's End because that's when Adam Cole ter re revealed himself as the devil and cost uh, MJF the AEW World Title, even though that entire angle was an absolute clusterfuck of a disaster and just went nowhere. And again, uh, just AEW storytelling is not the best, but... I thought this will. I, I would give this like a this match a thumbs, sort of going up. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It was it was a decent match. But again, I it's just I, it's getting hard for me to care about. It's becoming difficult for me to care about MJF because he's just oh it's MJF being a douche again. I've seen this. I just I I, I can't shake that feeling now because. Of everything that I described earlier, but Roger Roderick Strong deserves better. And then uh, he, after the match, he grabbed a chair and pilmanized the arm. And as soon as he pilmanized the arm, Adam Cole's music hit, and then he came out to the ring. <laughs> Which... <laughs> yeah, you missed it. You missed saving your friend by a solid minute there, buddy. So good. Adam Cole is a, a, be a good friend. He's a wonderful, wonderful guy. He's really good at saving his friends. I remember at that god-awful Grand Slam show in 2023 where uh, he came out to save MJF from Samoa Joe, and in the process, he destroyed his ankle. And now he misses uh, coming out of the ring because he wanted his entrance music to play first, and as a result, Roderick Strong's arm got broken in a chair. So 
the most wonderful baby face is Adam Cole. So, yeah, that, again, th this, this show was so damn goofy. But up next, up next is a match, I'm not gonna lie, I didn't want to like, but I did end up, I, I did end up enjoying this match, even though part of it made me want to rip my hair out. We had Mercedes Monet defending the AEW TBS Championship against Chris Statlander. And one of the better women's matches in wrestling of the year, as much as it makes me nauseous to say because I hate Mercedes Monet. But I do have some complaints. Uh, number one, the TBS Championship, the you know the women's secondary title in AEW, has officially replaced the AEW Women's World Title, as far as importance is concerned, the, the, the I swear to God, the TBS title and the uh, Women's World Title have swapped places. The most important title for the women is the TBS Championship. Not even because Mercedes Monet is holding it hostage, might I add. Not uh, not just not even because she's holding it because she's such a big star, which she's not. Her entire run in AEW has been just the most flaccid dick you could possibly imagine like there's no way you could put this flaccid dick into anything and to have them derive any sense of pleasure this is way too flaccid i don't care how much of a whore you are for this flaccid dick that is M mercedes monet in AEW. it's just not hitting and her being the ceo is just cringe everything about mercedes monet is cringe but it's not it doesn't even have anything to do with her like even before mercedes won the tbs title I just get the feeling that they just do not give a shit about the women's world title. Like, this secondary belt gets all of the airtime. Like, it is the usually the most promoted championship with the women. It's, it's so backwards as far as this championship's position and the wor women's world title. The women's world title wasn't even defended on the show. There was just a stupid segment that I mostly skipped between Mariah May and uh, Mina Shirakawa, I think her name is. Uh, the, the lesbian Japanese chick. Uh, they had a champagne celebration to that, which I, I I don't even remember where they placed that on the card, but I don't and I don't really care either. But I will say at least they had that on the show to break up between the nonstop match after match after match after match. They could have had more of that ways to break up the the pace of the show, you know, to give the audience a chance to breathe. But whatever. Um, but. I just don't like how the TBS championship has basically superseded the women's world title. I just I just don't like that. It doesn't make any sense. Also, another problem I had with this match, I swear to God, I never need to see another human being on this planet in any wrestling company ever use the use the Meteora ever again. Mercedes Monet hit about 50 Meteoras in this match. And honestly, the the more she spammed this move, the more irritated I got. Like, use different moves, Mercedes. For the I don't understand why so many people give her so many props as far as being a good wrestler. I, I, she is only good when she's in there with someone who is better than she is, or at the same level as she is. Because I just I just don't get the hype that she's ever had. As Sean McCarty has said, she is the fourth of the four horsewomen. She is massively overrated. And just her just spamming the same move over and over, I'm just like, alright, we get it. You like the Meteora. We get it. That really got on my nerves. And even after, I thought uh, there was a spot in this match where I was like, okay... They had her do that for a reason because she was getting too cocky, relying on the same move. Because one of the best spots in the match is she went for the 80th top rope Meteora in the match. And Chris Statlander caught her in midair and powerbombed the shit out of her in the corner. And it looked devastating. I was like, okay. Okay, I can dig that. But then as soon, after that, she nailed about four more Meteoras. And I was like, okay, so she's just... That's just her move, I guess. So that kind of ruined that for me. There there was another really cool spot in this match where she did a tilt world head scissors on Chris Statlander on the off the apron and Chris took this bump to the floor that looked nasty. So th there was some good stuff, some good back and forth in this match and Chris Statlander did a very good job selling the leg. Which again, there was 
Uh, the, whenever someone went really hard into selling a body part, like Roderick Strong selling the arm, Chris Statlander selling the leg, they did their damnedest to sell, and I appreciate that. So that, honestly, Chris Statlander was the star of this match, in my opinion. She's really good, and Mercedes Monet was just in there doing the Meteora. Um, and also, I, like, another criticism I have of this match, and the show as, as a whole, way too many near falls. One of the things that really exhausted the crowd was there was, like, a hundred nail-biting near falls in, like, every match. And there was a, there were multiple finisher kickouts in every match, just about, because Mercedes did her god-awful looking Monet Maker, which is that gory bomb into the flatliner kind of move that never look. it always looks atrocious, and Chris Statlander kicked out of it, which, it worked in this match, because the, you hadn't seen a hundred people kick out of a hundred finishers at this point in the show, because it was only the third match. Um, but still they kind of jumped the shark in this as far as like it, it, it turned into my issue with John Cena matches in like 2015 and 2016 where it was just big move kick out big move kick out it's why I didn't like John Cena versus AJ Styles at SummerSlam in 2016 you know everyone's favorite match for some reason that year the most overrated match of all time or one of them it was just big move kick out big move kick out. Big move. Kick out. That was most of the matches on this show. It was, it got old after a while. But again, I, I did, I, I, the person I enjoyed the most in this match was Chris Statlander. And of course, at the end of the match, they did, she was trying to do a move. She rolled through and Mercedes Monet pinned Chris Statlander just barely by the skin of her teeth. I did like that it, it did, it was kind of abrupt, but I took it as she was just desperate to do anything that would work, and she finally got a roll-up that worked. And I liked that she sold just exasperation by the end of the match, and just elation that she finally got this woman's shoulders pinned to the mat for a three-count. So I did like that, and I also loved the spot where she caught Mercedes in midair and uh, hit her with a uh, an F5. I liked that spot as well. There were some good spots in this match, some good back and forth, and some good selling. And I liked how... Say what you want about Mercedes. She's very good at being a cocky piece of shit that you just want to punch in the face because that's who she is as a person in real life. So yeah, I did have some criticisms of this match, but there were some good points in this match. So I did... I think this is one of the better women's matches of the year, but I do think they need to relax as far as like the near falls and Mercedes needs to, re needs to stop spamming the Meteora. So if she would stop that, I would have less of a problem. But after this... We had my favorite thing on the entire show, my favorite match, Jay White versus Hangman Adam Page in a singles match. They had a very good match uh, a month ago at Wrestle Dream. I very much enjoyed that match, especially the finish. Uh, this was an even better match that they had at Wrestle Dream. At first, I was kind of agitated because during the match, uh, uh, Hangman Adam Page started working on Jay White's leg. And I was like, we literally just saw this in the TBS Championship match. We literally just saw someone working on the leg. So I was like, okay, you're kind of rehashing the exact same thing you did in the previous match. But then Jay White started going after Hangman's leg, and they both ended up selling their leg the entire match. So I actually like that. So instead of just one person selling her leg in the match... The story of this match was both guys have a bad wheel. And they're both trying to wrestle through the pain in this match to win. And I was like, I haven't really seen that before. Going from one match where one person's selling a leg to the next match where they're both selling a leg. So I, I actually really dug that. I really dug that. And this was the best selling on the entire show. Because you could absolutely be convinced that both Jay White and Hangman Adam Page, both of them had leg injuries. Like, you could... I absolutely bought it, because every single move they did, every submission they tried, the things that they tried that didn't work because their legs were hurting, they did a very good job selling throughout this match. And it was basically a battle of attrition. Who could hold out the longest? Who could outmaneuver the other one? 
and I just thought it was solid. Like, there was a part of this match uh, that I loved where uh, um, Jay White went for a DDT, but Hangman was able to twist out of it, but Jay White countered whatever he was trying, and then hit him with the, D the DDT that he was trying to do, which is a an old-school, like, amateur wrestling thing where basically... If you have someone in a hold, or you're trying to do something and they counter out of it, they won't expect you to immediately try it again, and the second time you'll actually get them with it. So, that's some old school amateur wrestling psychology right there that I really liked. But yeah, this was really good. This was a really good match. Jay White is fantastic, and as much as I don't like Hangman Adam Page, he's pretty good on in his own right. Uh, and they have, they have excellent chemistry together. They have very good chemistry together. And I do like this this unhinged psychopath gimmick that Hangman's going with his the darker edge to his character. Um, and I, I I've always loved Jay White, and like Jay White is on another level. Like his body language, just the way he moves in the ring, the way he sells. This dude is so damn good. I just wish he was in WWE <laughs> because he's not gonna go anywhere in this company. Um, but yeah. But the, the finish of this match was my favorite thing on the entire show. It was so fluid, solid, and well thought out. Basically, through the pain of their leg injuries, they were trying to hit something, that one last thing on each other, but they just kept countering and countering and countering until Hangman went for the ankle lock one too many times and Jay White got out of it right into the Blade Runner for the 1-2-3. That whole finishing sequence was money was just yes sign me up so yeah i i loved this match this was my favorite thing on the show and i i would love to see jay white as AEW champion but i don't know if that's gonna happen he, I, I know he's going he, i know he's configured into the main event scene especially with how the show went off the air but again this was if you want to watch anything on the show i highly recommend jay white versus uh, hangman adam page and I just love that Hangman Adam Page lost. Because, again, I don't like him. And, yes, it has to do with the whole CM Punk thing. Because that was one of the death blows to this company. Even 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 two years out from what happened, it still has lingering effects uh, that I don't think this company will ever be able to shake. But that's just my opinion. But moving on, uh, we have probably my third favorite match on the show. Which I know a lot of people are going to like give me a, a, a side eye for saying that because this is probably most people's favorite match on the show um we have kyle fletcher defeating will osprey in a singles match this was very good this was very good but i got some serious issues with this match and honestly everything wrong with AEW can be boiled down to this match in particular will osprey is really good kyle fletcher is really good even though he's kind of generic they had a good match, and they beat the absolute piss out of one another. And I loved that Will Ospreay was selling like the like nerve damage in this match. Although the selling kind of stopped at a point, a selling to a realistic degree, because during this match, Kyle Fle and I know I know I'm skipping a lot. Of, this is not exactly a play by play. If you haven't noticed, uh, this, these are just the things that stood out to me the most during the show. During this match. Kyle Fletcher gave Will Ospreay a jumping tombstone pile driver from the apron on top of the steel steps. Motherfucker, that should have killed or paralyzed someone. Yet, Will Ospreay was up a minute later. He never gave... He, I will give them credit for this. Will Ospreay never regained control, thankfully, after this spot. But he should not have been able to make it back up to his feet after this. But, you know, like they have to do a million moves. They have to get all their shit in before they can go to the finish because the people that are in this company are stupid and don't understand how wrestling works or should work. But we have this company where pile drivers mean nothing. Meanwhile, in WWE, a couple weeks ago... Kevin Owens gave Randy Orton a pile driver, and they sold that as a deadly, near career ending, career threatening injury angle. They sold the shit out of that. They basically acted like Kevin Owens just 
turned Randy Orton into a quadriplegic live on television. Even though it was a kind of shitty looking pile driver. But still, just that right there is just condensed into one thing. That is every reason why WWE is succeeding right now and AEW is failing. AEW moves don't matter. They, they're rubber band people. They take no damage. They can withstand a nuclear warhead and still kick out at two. Meanwhile, in WWE, you never see pile drivers. It's a band move. They even they made that part of the kayfabe, and they do one, even though it was kind of shitty looking. And dead. He's dead. He's never going to see his children again. He's never going to wake up from a coma. He's paralyzed. He's never going to be able to fondle his own toes ever again. That right there, like, that is why WWE is succeeding right now. And that's why AEW is a clown show, according to a lot of people. Just that, that, that is every reason why. In WWE, they protect and respect moves. So long as you're not Cody Rhodes using the crossroads, because he always needs three to beat someone. But besides that, for the most part, WWE saves and respects moves. AEW does not. AEW is full throttle mayhem constantly all the time, inmates running the asylum. In WWE, they respect moves, and they're hotter than they've been in years. In AEW, they never respect moves, and they're colder than they've ever been. There is absolutely 100% a correlation there. And until they get a clue... And stop doing shit like this. And I'm not even just saying this because, oh my god, it's so dangerous. No, if you're going to do something like that, that should be the finish. That should be an injury angle. Kevin Owens pile driving Randy Orton, that was an injury angle. Because the people booking that show have brains. They know what the fuck they're doing. These, th this is, AEW is the markiest video game shit ever. And no shit people aren't watching. People are tuning out because it's ridiculous. It is absurd. It is a clown show. It is beyond unrealistic. So that very much annoyed me. Again, Will Ospreay didn't just start doing a bunch of moves and trying to win the match. He, he like It was all Kyle Fletcher for the rest of the match. But again, he should have rolled him in the ring and pinned him or rolled him in the ring and hit him with another move. But no, he rolled him in the ring, hit him with another fucking pile driver. And Will Ospreay kicked out, and when Will Ospreay kicked out of that second pile driver, that's when I was like, okay, fuck this company. Fuck this company, and fuck Tony Khan. This is such dumb horse shit. Now, a minute later, he hit him with a top rope brain buster onto the, the turnbuckle pad, and that was it. I swear to God, if Will Ospreay would have kicked out of that, I would have turned the whole show off. I would have turned the show off if Will Ospreay would have kicked out of that. Thankfully, he didn't, but still... He should not have kicked out of that second pile driver. That should have been it. But the fact that it, the, the fact that he kicked out, that's why AEW is failing. One of the many reasons, because they cannot help themselves. Will Osprey, his Will Osprey's neck should be in thirty-five bajillion pieces right now. Now I will give him credit; he was selling nerve damage. Like his his left arm was numb and he couldn't use it. So I did like that. Dude, his legs should have been the same. Like, his legs should have been numb. He should have been paralyzed. He took a jumping tombstone pile driver on the steel steps. He should be fucking dead. Yet he's still up trying to punch Kyle Fletcher. No, that is not something you stagger to your feet back up from. That's something that gives you a fucking seizure. Like, when Brian Danielson had a seizure back at uh, what I think it might have been Forbidden Door, wh whatever show it was... Where it was, uh, it might have been Dynasty. It might have been Dynasty. I think it was Dynasty. Where it was Will Ospreay versus Brian Danielson, and Brian Danielson gave him the Tiger Driver 91, and Daniel Bryan, or Brian, excuse me, Brian Danielson sold it by having a seizure, and that was the end of the match. That's That should have been what happened here. Tombstone to the steel leads to Will Ospreay convulsing, and then Kyle Fletcher does, like, either rolls him in the ring and pins him, or we get a hard ref stop, or he hit him, hits him with another move, and that's it. Like, I would have accepted that. I would have loved that. I would have been like, hot damn, that was a finish. Jesus. That's one way to do it, but no, they, they can't help but... They can't but be shoved up their own ass as far as... 
We have to have impossible near falls all the time. How can we do ridiculous shit and kick out of it this time? It's 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 such indie horse shit. And I was enjoying the match up until that. Up until that, I was very... Up until that, this was on its way to being my favorite thing on the show, and then that ruined it. It was still it was still a good match. It was still a really good match. Will Ospreay always has good matches, but this ridiculous, let's do ma a move that should cripple someone and then get back up. That shit has got to stop, and AEW is not going to succeed. And I want AEW to succeed. I, I say it just about every time I review a show from this stupid fucking company. What's better than one good wrestling company? Two good wrestling companies. But un until they stop doing ki this kind of dumb shit, there's only going to be one good wrestling company, and it's not AEW. And if anyone's going to sit there and say, oh, you're just, a, you're just a fan of the Fed, you're just a WWE mark, shut the fuck up. Go back and listen to my, like, me, Sean, and Skyler's catalog of wrestling shows where we give WWE shows 1 out of 10. Or we gave WrestleMania 38 Night 2 a 0 out of 30. So go fuck yourself if that's what your reaction to me saying that is. But yeah, I thought this was a good match, but damn, they, they're they never going to. That's just how they're going to do things, and they're never going to succeed. It's just They're just going to continue to circle the drain, but... I would have enjoyed the match if we didn't. We did not need the leaping tombstone on the steel steps. We didn't need that. If that wasn't the finish, then don't do it. If that's not an injury angle, then don't do it. Like they have no sense of restraint, and it's ridiculous and it's infuriating. But, but I will say it is good that they gave Kyle Fletcher the win. They're actually trying to do something with him again. He's a tad generic, but. At least they're trying to do something with him. At least he got the clean win. I will say there was not a whole lot of shenanigans on this show. Like, there was a lot of clean wins. A lot of heel clean wins. Which I, I can't complain about too much. It's just, less is more. Less is more and less will always be more. But speaking of generic, up next we have two tiny generic white dudes fighting over a... Ugly looking championship with someone else's blood on top of it. We have Jack Perry defending the TNT championship against Daniel Garcia. Uh, and this was the part of the show where the crowd started suffocating. I thought this was good. But this absolutely should be a TV show main event. The crowd, like, the crowd got into it near, tier, towards the end. And there were some good spots. Like... There was a part where Jack Perry powerbombed the shit out of Daniel Garcia through a table at ringside. That looked brutal. And then he started covering him with garbage. I like that spot. But I just cannot get into Daniel Garcia. He is just the most generic looking person I think I've ever... He looks like a, the default caw on a wrestling game. And he kind of wrestles like it too. But just... He just looks like... A random white dude. I just... he There's nothing interesting about him. The only interesting thing about him was that god-awful hip swivel that he thankfully stopped doing. But yeah, this, this match was fine. Again, a running theme with the show. The match was fine. It's just... And also... Ja I, <sighs> Jack Perry looks like a five-year-old. He looks like a five-year-old. Like, I, you have the most generic dude on earth versus a very hairy five-year-old for a championship in this company. This is an indie fed with a, somewhat of a budget. This isn't where the best wrestle. This is where the midgets wrestle. Just, God, this match really was like, oh my God. This should be for, like, the cruiserweight championship. I, I just, I don't know. And also, the TNT Championship is useless. The international, or excuse me, the, as Tony Schiavone called it, the Intercontinental Championship. I heard that, Tony! You little shitbag. I heard that in the upcoming matchup, which I'll get to. But, just, they need to fuse the TNT Championship with the international title and the continental title. Again, they don't need three secondary belts. Fuse them together. Get rid of two of them. I don't give a shit. One secondary belt is enough. 
That's all you need. You don't need three. You don't need four. You don't need 45. But man, the crowd, it, it took a second, but the crowd did get into this match, especially with some of the bigger near falls. Um, although, again, in this match, uh, near the finish, uh, Jack Perry grabbed the TNT title and handed it to Danny Garcia, basically daring him to hit him with it, you know, to get himself disqualified so he would retain. Uh, Daniel Garcia didn't fall for it. He gave the belt to the uh, to Rick Knox, the worst referee ever. And, the, and while the referee was getting rid of the belt, Jack Perry, surprise, low blow, hit Danny Garcia in his very generic ball sack. And then hit him with the running knee strike, which is Jack Perry's finishing move. And then Daniel Garcia kicked out. Because, again, this company doesn't exactly do finishing moves. Everyone's finisher has to be kicked out of 47 times. And, again, like, we don't need 100 near falls in every match. And, again, this is when the crowd was really starting to feel winded. Because, again, we had the 85 near falls in this match as well. Just, uh. in a vacuum, these would be really good, really fun matches, but rapid fire one after the other, just how could you care? They do way too much. This is the most, this is the most they did way too much AEW show I've ever seen. And it wasn't, it, there wasn't even any like hardcore shit on this show. There wasn't any stipulation match. It was just a bunch of singles matches, and they still found a way to do way too much. It's ridiculous. Like, even someone with, like, hardcore ADHD wouldn't be able to, like, just stomach or ingest everything that happened on this show. They just throw so much shit at the wall. It's ridiculous. Uh, and again, the crowd was exhausted, but they did kind of get into this match, and finally, Daniel Garcia won with... Uh, a kind of sharpshooter, kind of. To win the TNT Championship, it was like the one time a babyface won on this show. Oh, and also, speaking of things that people are... Kind of similar to MJF's gimmick being stale, I was complaining about earlier. The whole scapegoat thing with Jack Perry, that is also very stale. And also, he looks like a toddler, and this toddler walks out to the ring with a, with a, a, a demonic-looking goat mask, and it just looks silly. Dude, Halloween was last month. It's 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 almost December, Jack. We're not trick-or-treating anymore. Put the mask away. I get it. You're you're a little kid, you want the candy. I understand, Jack. But enough. The scapegoat thing is dead, and no one cares. Literally the only reason why people popped at the finish of this match is people were like, oh, thank God, Jack Perry's not the champion anymore. That's why people popped. No one gives a shit about Daniel Garcia. The only time people cared about Daniel Garcia is when he was doing that stupid little dance because human society was a mistake. So yeah, this was fine, but we move on to... Honestly, the most comatose the crowd was during the entire show. This did not need to be on the show. We had Kanosuke Takeshita, who I really like, defending the AEW International Championship against an actual baby called Ricochet. This was the most... Te this, this was a rampage match that somehow made its way to pay-per-view. And I was kind of looking forward to it. I don't know when they announced this, but I, when they announced, when they, it was during one of the previous matches, they were like, later tonight, we're having this match. I was like, oh, so they are doing Takeshita and Ricochet. Because it's an AEW show, you have to cram every single match humanly possible onto one card. You have to suffocate your audience with matches. And this is, this, more, more than any other match on the show, this is when the crowd was really gassed. The crowd was dead silent for this. And Ricochet, being the giant fucking man baby that he is, absolutely deserved it. So I kind of, and he got pinned. So haha, -ha, fuck you, Ricochet. It's basically if Will Osprey was a giant baby. So, uh, and for those of you wondering why I have such a beef with Ricochet all of a sudden, go look at his, uh, go look at his ex, or, or Twitter, not 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 his ex girlfriend, which is soon to be Sam Irvin. Uh, 
But his Twitter profile, he is just the biggest man baby on planet Earth. He's pathetic, and I, I'm glad he's not in WWE anymore. I'm glad that he's wasting away doing nothing in AEW. But this match, like, it was just a bunch of moves, and the crowd didn't care. And then they did even more moves, and the crowd still did not care. And then they did, surprise, even more moves. And then the crowd, surprise, still didn't care. Because they were fucking exhausted. Like, you could just hear the crowd going, <gasps> Oh, God! I need a respirator! <laughs> Get the respirator! The entire audience in Newark or New Jersey needs needs CPR. They're dead. Like, it's, the crowd felt like post-marathon. Just, the crowd, oh my God, was silent. I felt bad for Takeshita because I like the dude, and the dude's super talented, and no one throws a forearm or a knee strike like Takeshita. No one does a blue thunder bomb like Takeshita. He's so damn good, and he was in this just death match. And not even the kind of death match that AEW has a boner for. No, this was the death spot. The crowd was, like, even the crickets were bored. Even the crickets were like, yeah, what's WWE doing right now? <laughs> It was sad. Nothing in this match stood out. And then it had the flattest finish. Oh, bef oh before that, though. Before that, though. Uh, Ricochet kicked out of the power strike, power drive knee, or whatever he calls it. That's Takeshita's finisher. Because, of course, even in this match, where the crowd is sitting on their hands asleep, not making a fucking sound, even in this match, they had to do finisher kickouts. Because, of course... I hate AEW so much for this kind of shit. Read the room. Read the fucking room. If the crowd is dead, just give up and go home. If I was wrestling a match and the crowd was fucking asleep, I, I would be like, you know what? We need to go home. We need to get out of here. We're not doing a bajillion near falls. The cause is lost. No when the cause is lost. And they are just incapable of knowing when the cause is lost. But still, this finish was the most flaccid of flaccid dicks. Ricochet is on the top, the top rope, because he wants to do a flip. Because that's the only thing in this life that he's good at, which is doing flips. But Kanosuke gives him a, a knee strike to the back. And then a top rope Falcon's arrow. And that's the finish. And I was like, what? Huh? That's that's the finish? And even the crowd was like, that's it? He just hit him with a move and won. It was the, it was the bad kind of out of nowhere. Like, the earlier match between Jay White and Hangman Adam Page, he hit him with the Blade Runner out of nowhere, and everyone was like, oh, that was sick, because it was counter after counter after counter, and the crowd was getting louder and louder and louder after each successive uh, counter. But in this, the crowd was like, all right, like I could actually hear the crowd go, okay, <laughs> all right, that was uh, that's it then I guess. This sucked. <laughs> this was not. This was not it. This was not very good. Like honestly, this should have kicked off the show instead of the stupid four way tag that I didn't even watch. They should have started the show with this match and not win with a top row. Like, when is the last time some I the last time I saw someone win a match with a Falcon Arrow was that one match on Raw between Seth Rollins and Dolph Ziggler in like 2018 I think. But yeah, that this this was a wet fart of a match. Just to catch to deserves better. Uh, fuck Ricochet. Uh, after this we had another. Actually, this was a good match. I actually really like what they did with this match. It was Bobby Lashley versus Swerve Strickland in a singles match. This was probably my second favorite match on the entire show because it was simple and straightforward and all of the... It was the most WWE feeling match on the show. Man, people... I'm not real... I'm really not beating the allegations of you're just a... You're just a fed shill. I'm not, but again, I can't help that they do it better. But, uh... Yeah, this was... A very simple, solid introduction for Bobby Lashley, although apparently they couldn't even wait until this pay-per-view to have Bobby Lashley have his debut, because apparently on Dynamite, he wrestled 
a handicap match against this one dude and another dude named Cheeseburger. I'm not beating the allegations of sucking Triple H's dick, and AEW is not beating the allegations of being a giant indie fed. But yeah, so uh, th basically this match was 70-30. Bobby Lashley beating up Swerve Strickland and Swerve Strickland getting some hope spots here and there. They made Bobby Lashley look like a monster in this match. It was great. He powered him around. Uh, he speared him through the barricade, which we've seen a billion times. But the way AEW's ba barricades are set up is different than WWE, so it doesn't look like it was made to break. So it looked more devastating. Best thing in the entire match was at the point where Swerve ran up the steps and stomped Bobby Lashley through the announce table. That was fantastic. But again, during the match... After that happened, he hit the house call kick and then hit another swerve stomp inside the ring and Bobby Lashley kicked out because in every single match, we've got to have a finisher kick out. Ah! Stop! Enough! I've had it with finisher kick outs. Respect moves. God. Thankfully, with this being the most straightforward match of the show, there's not a whole lot to get into. I loved that basically Bobby Lashley dominated, speared him through the barricade, speared him in the ring, put him in the hurt lock, and that was it. Made him pass out. Bobby Lashley needed to look dominant in his pay-per-view debut for AEW, and I'm glad that basically this was this was the perfect way to do it because he didn't dem he didn't squash Swerve, uh, which I think would have been the wrong move. They gave swerve just enough to make him still like credible they made it competitive although bobby lashley clearly had the advantage throughout the match so this honestly this was a thumbs up there were some it sounds like i'm shitting on a lot of the show which i am but there were some thumbs up moments during the show and this match was one of them honestly if there are two matches i would recommend you go watch it would be hangman adam page and jay white and bobby lashley and swerve strickland because those were the two best things on the entire show in my opinion and then we had our main event, John Moxley defending the AEW World Championship against Orange Cassidy in a singles match. These two have had great matches in the past. I loved their match last year, All Out. Uh, their match at Full Gear last year was not as good as their All Out match, but I still thought it was decent. Um, if I'm being perfectly honest, this is my least favorite match I've seen between these two. It started out good. I liked the hot start, considering the severity of the feud and the video package that preceded it. Um, although, after after a while, for, for one, when Orange Cassidy had John Moxley on the announce table and was giving those mounted punches, they got a shoot from a better angle because these were the fakest looking punches, the most gentle love taps I've ever seen. And then we had the John Moxley special of the match already started, but we're going to spend five minutes outside the ring doing shit, and the referee's not going to count, because, because apparently this is a no-count-out match. And honestly, when that was happening, it killed the entire match for me, because I was like, I, I fucking hate John Moxley. There were parts of the match where I was just shouting at my TV, GET IN THE RING! Can we not have... Can John Moxley just get in the fucking ring? It was so irritating. And of course, he gave him the paradigm shift DDT on the steps, which which busted open Orange Cassidy, so we did have blood, but it wasn't from John Moxley, shocking enough. And then it kind of turned into a little bit of what I liked about their match at All Out, where it was John Moxley just beating the shit out of Orange Cassidy, but it wasn't as good. Because again, I just John Moxley just looks stiff and not the kind of stiff as in oh we hit him hard, but stiff as in unmoving. Like he just does not look fluid. He just does not. He looks like a statue trying to wrestle. He looks like he doesn't care. He looks like he doesn't give a shit. Like he he cannot like I one of my complaints about Santos Escobar is Santos Escobar doesn't know how to sell punches. Does not know how to sell being hit in the head. Because he just kind of just stays in one spot and doesn't doesn't recoil or doesn't back up or sell the punch. John Moxley does that, but like a billion times worse. He just stays there like it doesn't affect him at all. Because he's too lazy to fucking sell anything. Just John Moxley just strikes me as lazy whenever he's wrestling. He just strikes me as as lazy. 
But when he was on offense, he looked kind not. I'm going to compare this to their match at full at uh, all out last year a lot because during that match he looked like a devastating psychopath, a dangerous man to be in the ring with, and he kind of looked like uh, the it was kind of like the wish uh, dollar store variant of that, and it just wasn't that interesting. And plus, in this match, the first five minutes of the match were them brawling on the outside, which is the John Moxley of special of. I'm going to make the referee look incompetent because the referee's not going to count even though we're outside the ring. We're just brawling because I love CZW hardcore shit where I just fight everywhere because I'm more concerned about that than actually wrestling because John Moxley sucks. So, of course, they were wrestling and I wasn't really into it. The crowd was kind of into it, but kind of not because they were exhausted at this point. And at a point... Uh, Orange Cassidy just starts spamming the shit out of the Orange Punch, basically turning it into the Superman Punch, except Roman Reigns does it better, because he actually has, you know, big muscles. But then Orange Cassidy started doing the play kicks, and I was like, I thought you hated this fucker and thought he was a threat to your very livelihood, but now, no, we're going to do the goofy play kicks. So that annoyed me. And then and then everyone started interfering, and I stopped, I started caring less and less and less. And the finish of this match was the referee was distracted by something, and Wheeler fucking Yuta hits Orange Cassidy with the Busaiko knee, and then John Moxley hits him with the Death Rider DDT for the 1-2-3. Really? You, your finish of the pay-per-view is Wheeler Yuta with the distraction. Wheeler Yuta looks like a troll bobblehead. He looks like one of those troll bobbleheads that you put at the front of your car. When you're going on like a like an expedition. He looks so goofy. He looks like a jobber. If this were WWE, he would be a jobber. Yet no, in this company, he's the deciding factor in your world championship main event. Are you fucking serious? Goofy ass bullshit. I said when this match was over. And then after that, we had a cavalcade of nonsense. Uh, we had... We had... Wheeler Yuta and John Moxley kind of but not really dump they the, the idea was they were going to try to make Orange Cassidy drink cleaning liquid but instead they just kind of splashed it on him and Orange Cassidy started selling like he had drank it so he was dying even though it just went all over his body it was it, it was kind of goofy and weird like they could have at least sold it as oh He's they they put they put that into his wound so it's burning his wound. They could have just put like rubbing alcohol on his on his wound because you know when you have an open wound and you put rubbing alcohol on it it burns. No, we're gonna pretend that he drank cleaning fluid, even though he clearly didn't. It went everywhere but his mouth. So that was goofy. And then Hangman Adam Page came out and attacked Wheeler Yuta. He hit him in the head with a chair like the 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 edge of that. He got him good with that. Which was kind of dangerous looking, but it's Wheeler Yuta. It was Wheeler useless, so I, I would love to hit him in the head with a chair myself just to get him off the TV. Uh, and then that led to Christian Cage coming out with his totally not Money in the Bank contract. And then Jay White came out and attacked both of them. And then uh, the Death Riders escaped, only for Darby Allen to drive a car into their truck. And then he was on the top of their truck screaming at him as they stole someone else's car, and they left, and that's how the show ended, with Darby Allen screaming. And I was like, well, that was a lot. That, that, that was a lot to process there. And at first glance, it might seem like a bunch of just nonsense, just, just a bunch of shit thrown at the wall, but from what I heard, because uh, again, I haven't been watching Dynamite because there's no reason to, um, I've heard that this play, that the ending where a bunch of people were coming out, this plays into a lot of storylines that are developing on Dynamite. So, apparently, if you have been watching Dynamite, this would make sense. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna knock it because if they're building to more storylines and using the pay per view to help do that, then I'm, then I'm not gonna complain. Although this did kind of feel like a go home angle, so. I, I, if this is their way of trying to get people to tune into Dynamite to see what happens next, I mean, that's smart. That's what you should do. But, uh, I honestly, I kind of enjoyed the post-match more than the match itself. I didn't really care for this main event. I, I, I enjoyed the aftermath, the hijinks, more than the uh, actual main event itself. So, Full Gear 2024 
was mostly some misses with a few hits here and there. Complete and total disregard for moves uh, and logic and common sense. Except there were a few places where logic and common sense and the, the concept known as selling actually did become important here and there. But um, I did not enjoy a lot of this show. There was a lot of the show that I just did not enjoy, and same with the crowd. The crowd was exa exhausted. The format of this show sucks. There is no room to breathe anywhere. It is just foot on the gas pedal until the entire audience runs out of gas halfway through the show. Uh, but there were some good matches. I enjoyed uh, Jay White and Hangman Adam Page. I enjoyed the TBS Championship match, even though Mercedes Monet needs to stop spamming the Meteora every chance she gets. Will Ospreay and Kyle Fletcher was good until they killed the concept of the pile driver, which this company is has killed that concept 85 bajillion times, so I don't even know why I'm still whining about it. Uh, and Bobby Lashley and uh, Swerve Strickland was also really good. So if you want to watch anything off the show, go watch those matches. All in all, I was not super crazy about this show. I'm going to give it a Bret Hart certified 4 out of 10. There were some good things on the show, but it mostly just irritated me, and I just... They're doubling down on things that aren't working, because Tony Khan is incapable of taking criticism, he's incapable of learning, and this company, this show, is just going to continue to circle the drain. I don't care how much money that Warner Bros. keeps throwing at the problem, it's not, it's not going to make the problem go away. Warner Bros. like setting their own money on fire, which... That's what this year has told me. Warner Brothers Discovery does not like having money. And Tony Khan does not like having an audience. Clearly. So yeah, those are my thoughts on AEW Full Gear. What did you think of the show? Uh, do you like that WWE actually cares about pile drivers? So, uh, what are your thoughts? Sound off down below. Uh, either on YouTube or on Rumble. Whatever you're listening to this on. Uh, I will see you guys next time. Like, comment, subscribe, and all that fun stuff. Or follow me on Rumble. Later, everybody.